This is an introduction to McKay, Chapter 13, Reformation and Religious Wars, and it covers the time period from 1500 to 1600. So, overlapping, uh, to some extent, with the Renaissance Chapter 12, uh, with the Exploration Chapter 14, um, and even some of the later chapters that we'll get into later. Uh, but whereas the Renaissance uh, was focusing on the, the, the political and social developments of the period, this is very much a religious history chapter. And this painting, which you may or may not have already seen at some point in the past, depicts the dramatic confrontation between the monk Martin Luther and the Holy Roman Emperor and the Catholic Cardinal at the Diet of Worms, where Luther was challenged to recant his criticisms of the church, and he refused, famously declaring, here I stand, I can do no other. Um, and so this seminal religious conflict is the heart of, of this chapter. So the big questions that come out of this unit um, begin with, why does the Reformation happen? Um, if the Catholic Church had problems and corruptions and criticisms that went back decades or centuries, why is it that in the 16th century that we see the Reformation really happen? What's special about this period that allows the Reformation to take off? Next, you'll need to think about was the Reformation primarily a political event, a religious event, or a social event? It, it, um, it is often presented as a religious story with controversy about religious doctrine and, and the role of religion, and it clearly is that. But as you will see from the chapter, there are also political elements to the Reformation, there are social elements, there are even economic and artistic elements that make up the Reformation. All of them have a role to play. You're going to have to think about how do they rate, how do we compare them, what elements are primary in explaining the Reformation, which of them are secondary. Then you got to move on to why does the Reformation succeed? Um, if the church had had these criticisms and critics going back centuries, why is it that in the 16th century we see those criticisms take root and we see the creation of new churches, the Protestant churches? Why does the Catholic Church finally break apart? The flip side of that, of course, is, well, why does the Catholic Church survive at all? If these criticisms were so well-founded and well-accepted, why does the church go forward and retain the, or some very substantial political, social, religious power uh, going, going forward? That, um, that, that will get us into the questions of what we call the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Reformation uh, at the end of the chapter. Finally, in this chapter, you'll be introduced to the DBQ. What is a DBQ, and what is the role of the DBQ in AP Euro? Uh, one of the real central things that we work on in, in this course, and something that you'll want to uh, become very familiar with. Okay, so starting now to work through the particular sections of this chapter. The beginning of the, uh, of the chapter, the first section, is simply called the Early Reformation. Uh, and the question that McKay poses here is, what were the central ideas of the Reformation? Why were they appealing to different social groups? This is basically the story of the Catholic Church and Martin Luther. Luther is the central figure of the Reformation and the impact of that, the reasons for that, are absolutely crucial to understanding this period. This is one of the places where we're really going to be introduced to the whole idea of 
what some of them called the great man school of history. Um, do we understand the Reformation as being about the actions of really important, uh, uh, powerful individuals, great men like Luther? Um, or do we understand history as being the product of larger forces and contexts in which individuals uh, are actors but are not the drivers of change? This section presents Luther as a central man, a great man, uh, and, and his role in the story is, is terribly important. In this section, uh, McKay has a rather lengthy sec excerpt from a primary source, one of Luther's writings called On Christian Liberty. And you're going to want to take the time to really understand the argument that Luther is making, to understand what does Luther mean when he writes of liberty? It's not what a 21st century American would probably mean by the term. This particular uh, image, by the way, uh, is twofold. The picture on the left is of the, uh, one of the original editions of Luther's essay. The figure on the right, uh, those of you who had Playmobil toys as kids may recognize, uh, is a Playmobil figure of Martin Luther. Now, Playmobil is huge in Germany, and when they introduced the Luther figure a few years ago, it quickly became the fastest selling Playmobil figure of all time. So Luther is still rocking the preteen toy market. Also in this section, you'll be introduced to Anna Jans, and she deserves your time also because she is one of the true all time ride or die women. She is a Protestant um, who suffers persecution and ultimately execution for her beliefs. And she's worth study both for her significance within Protestantism and her Anabaptist faith, but also for her role in uh, the, the women in the movement, women and the Reformation and their roles which deserve our attention. Okay, so, so then we move into, uh, McKay moves into a short but very important section on the Reformation and German politics. And here McKay addresses the question of how does the political situation in Germany shape the course of the Reformation. And here McKay is previewing a very important argument. Whereas the first section, we can think of it as great man's school of history, Martin Luther, his role, his thought, his writings, his impact. The second section, this section, is about political context. And the argument McKay is addressing here is the Reformation is a political event. The reason the Reformation succeeds is not because Luther is so specially awesome, but because German politics in the 16th century were different than earlier politics, that German lords recognized that the Holy Roman Emperor was trying to centralize power, was trying to limit and control them, and they found a way to resist this centralization in the ideas of Luther. So this is the political argument about the Reformation. It's a very important argument and one that you need to make sure that you, you understand. Next, we go on to the, the spread of Protestantism and how Protestantism goes from being a German phenomenon to a European phenomenon. The critical question here is how do Protestant ideas and institutions spread beyond the German-speaking lands? Um, how does it go from regional to continental? This is a picture of uh, John Calvin, who is the uh, the, the progenitor of a different kind of Protestant faith, which comes to be known as Calvinism. Uh, and, and you'll be introduced to him and other uh, variations on Protestantism. Calvin is a very interesting, and in many ways very scary guy. Uh, you'll be introduced to some of his thought in uh, a primary source that are ordinances or laws that were passed in, in Geneva. Um, Calvin 
was invited to become essentially the ruler of Geneva because they admired his Protestant thinking, and he turns Geneva into essentially a Protestant theocracy, which is very harshly ruled, and the ordinances that Calvin has passed in Geneva tell us something about early Protestants, about the, about the, the zeal and the, the commitment of these people. So, so think about that. Think about what this sort of evidence tells us about these early believers. Then McKay moves to the, to the flip side of, of the coin, which is the reaction. The, the reaction to all this Protestant movement, what we come to know as the Catholic Reformation, how the Catholic Church responds to what's been going on. And the question here is, what reforms does the Catholic Church make? How does it respond to the Protestant reform movements? One of the important things that we have to bear in mind here is that the Catholic Church is extraordinarily adaptable. The Catholic Church does not survive for centuries and centuries and centuries by being rigid, inflexible, stupid, cruel. Um, The Catholic Church has survived and retained its significance for centuries because it changes as, as it must. And the response to the Protestant Reformation is one of the best examples of that. So here we'll get into what the church does, how it does it, and how it uh, survives and, and even prospers in the face of the Protestant challenge. Finally, the last section is about conflict. Uh, it's about religious violence and what the, were the causes and consequences of the religious violence that occurred as a result of all this religious tumult. We're going to look at riots, uh, and sort of civil strife. We're going to look at actual full-blown wars and the witch hunts, all of which grew out of the controversy and stress and drama of the Reformation. The consequences in this, in, in this respect are quite hideous and leave terrible scars uh, on Europe and upon faith, but they're also terribly important, uh, both for understanding the period and for understanding what comes next. So uh, be sure to keep an eye on and, and, and some analysis on what's happening there. All right, so that's the chapter. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in class.